Hi, my name is Jay Eastman, and along with Mike Betts and Diana Anton, it's a joy to be with you today and engage with the topic of fostering a disciple-making culture in Europe. Behind me, we have the whole Bible printed in poster form. And we know that disciple making isn't just taking this printed word and kind of wrapping it as a poster around another human being and saying you're good to go. It is very much engaging with the living word in time, in space, the power and the presence of God as we walk and follow Jesus. Philippians tells us that God is at work in us. And this has two important pieces. First, that this renewal is 100% guaranteed by our Lord and Savior. He is at work in us. It also means that as that works out in our faith with fear and trembling, that this takes relationship and guidance and support as well as time. So please join Mike and Diana as they unpack this dynamic for us. And then I'll be back at the end to offer us an invitation to join together to continue fostering this culture of disciple making. Well, welcome to this session uh, entitled Fostering a Disciple Making Culture. It's good to have you with us. My name's Mike Betts. Um, and for 15 minutes or so, I'm gonna just try and stimulate our thinking a little bit as concerning disciple making. And the first thing that it says within the title is that disciple making within local church life is, is a culture. It's not an event. It's not a department. It's not something that we can just um, purchase some tools or some resources and then say, oh, let's do that and everybody will become a disciple. Now, tools can be helpful, but there has to be an underlying culture that pervades that. Something that, about the way we think, the way we act, the way we do things around here. That's kind of what culture is. It's almost the unspoken, instinctive, intuitive ways that we behave and talk and think that shape our, our processes, shape our conduct, our behaviour, our choices and our thinking. Uh, and you can see a disciple-making culture within the, the Bible, but within the New Testament particularly, I'm just going to hone in on one personal example and one a corporate example. In Paul, in Philippians chapter 1, says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers have become confident to the Lord by my imprisonment and are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defence of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to inflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Now, Paul was able to rejoice in the fruitfulness, the coming to the fore, the, the acceleration of others in ministry, even at his own per personal time of curtailment, when he himself wasn't able to do what he felt called to do. He, he wasn't somehow despondent about that. He said, what's happened to me has actually enabled people to step forward and to take more responsibility, to speak more boldly. He was actually thankful for the way that uh, the whole thing was beginning to pan out for him because he said, ah, oh, many have become bolder. And even when the motives weren't all right, he was still at the heart rejoicing that the gospel was preached. Now that is a disciple-making culture with an individual leader. It's not threatened by his own limits but actually rejoices that there are others who can keep multiplying what he feels the mission essentially is and then we find Paul commenting in Romans 15 about a collective culture of disciple making and in Romans 15 he writes to the Roman church and in verse 14 he says I myself am satisfied about you my brothers that you yourselves are full of goodness filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another now, what he, and then he goes on to say, but on some points I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God. Now, he's saying that, yeah, I've still got a part to play. That there's a grace on me to help you in certain areas where there's some blind spots. I can bring a gift to help you. But his comment when he looks at the church is collectively, you're full of goodness. So your character's good. 
you're filled with all knowledge, so there's knowledge there, and you're able to instruct one another. There's skills. So there's knowledge, character, and skills, three essential components of a disciple-making culture and of a healthy church culture that's producing disciples. And he says, I've observed this. I can see it's there. I'm satisfied it's there. Now, that means that he had a look at it over a period of time. He assessed it. He heard about it. It wasn't just something they'd immediately done. So a culture had been established. So culture uh, of disciple making, we're, we're kind of using this session just to invite and stimulate uh, many of us across the nations of Europe to go on a bit of a journey of developing a dis disciple making culture in our churches and in our movements, in our um, mission organisations that we're involved in. Second thing is... To have this culture, it's got to flow from a heart desire. It's got to be what we really want. John the Baptist, when Jesus was becoming more prominent than him, he said, a man can only receive what he's given from heaven. He was quite satisfied that he was doing what he was called to do. And he didn't get defensive or protective when his ministry was under threat from one who was then coming who would exceed him and, and, and uh, in some ways sort of like um, eclipse him. He knew that what, he was comfortable in his own calling. And certainly if we're going to produce disciples, we've got to be comfortable in our own calling, comfortable in who God has made us to be. Because otherwise we'll only ever pick people to invest with who we don't think could ever become better than us or go ahead of us, because then it would keep us at the top of the pile. So we've got to die to a sort of a, a self-protection. That's a cultural way of thinking. Um, there's got to be a desire to empower others, a desire to see people go ahead of us, uh, a desire for legacy thinking. You know, I've, I've had the privilege of being a Christian now for about 40 years and the investment that's been put into me, the, 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 the wonderful things I've heard and seen and been involved in from godly men and women over the years, I feel like I'm a filing cabinet of so much that I've been the privilege to witness and learn and be taught and, and have modelled to me. I don't want that to die with me. I want to pass that on so that others can go further and run faster with it. I want my, my ceiling to be their floor. I want my shoulders to be the thing they stand on, to go even further with the things that I've had the privilege of knowing. There's got to be a longing of our hearts to create the opposite of a dependency culture. Because discipleship will mean that we actually don't create a system where people keep reliant on us. It's not command and control. It's more about sharing values and then releasing people. So we actually lose control. We're, we're, we're giving people our very best so that they can take the best from us and run on in their own journey. Um, and our personal definition of success and fruitfulness now has to become not just have I been obedient to what God asked me to do, but have I successfully and fruitfully passed on the benefit of what I've had into the lives of others who will go after me. I often talk about um, leadership culture, uh, uh, sorry, discipleship culture in terms of being a two-eyed leader. And we've got two eyes, and if you cover one up, it's a bit limited just looking out of one, isn't it? And so discipleship, I think, is a bit like that. The first eye is about keeping your eye on yourself, making sure you run the race that God's called you to do, so that you're actually setting an example that people want to emulate. Paul said to Timothy, he said, whatever you've seen in me, or heard from me, put it into practice. In other words, there's got to be something that people think, in a funny way, I kind of want to be a bit like you. I want to be near you to learn from you. There's got to be something that people think is worth having from us. So we've got to keep developing ourselves and keep improving and trying to grow in Christ as best we can. But the other eye, we switch eyes, is about looking at other people, keeping an eye on other people so that we are always investing, always living life, thinking about how can I help this person move on? How can I use this opportunity that I'm taking to disciple someone else? Things like taking someone with me on a trip or having someone to pray with me when I pray in the mornings or things like that where we can not only do something ourselves but involve someone else in what we're doing. So there's a two-eyed approach I found that quite helpful uh, in the end. Next, there needs to be a family culture within the church. It, the church is a family. It's not a business. Uh, it's not an organisation. And it shouldn't be run like one. It shouldn't be run like a business. It should be, and it shouldn't be the multiplication of a brand or something we're trying to promote or multiply. No, the church is family. 
It's friends. The language of the New Testament is dear friends or mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters. That is the language of the Bible. And we find that uh, throughout uh, the references in, in the New Testament, particularly to the way that culture in church, in family, in church needs to be. It's a family thing. And out of families, we produce sons and daughters who become mothers and fathers. Paul lamented, he said, you've got many guardians, you know, many people who can do stuff, but you don't have many fathers. And that's because I think the, the, um, the family root is a very self-sacrificing route. It says in Corinthians, you know, children don't save for their parents, parents save for their children. So those of us in leadership now have got to be giving away, giving away, giving away into the benefit of those who are coming uh, up behind us, as it were, or running alongside us. And then lastly, just a few tools to help us, because I found little, little tools to discipleship just help turn aspiration into uh, action. Now, the tools serve the vision, but the tools mustn't become the vision. And there's many different discipling, disciple making tools and products and, and organizations and movements out there. And they're all superb. Yes, some really superb things. Find something that fits you. Find something that kind of feels it lands well with you. But it's got to, I think, discipleship got to, to contain a few things. Firstly, it's got to be formal and informal. So there's times of planned in time with either a person or a group or a, a, a large group of discipleship but it also needs to be informal time sharing your life doing life together things that are not so much based on an event but based on just life um, th that's got to be in there next is what I call orbits and if you've got a lot of people and you're thinking where do I start I would suggest you think about like I don't know the, the sun and the, the planets orbiting around the solar system around the sun or whatever and you think some are in a short orbit very near to the sun some are in a medium orbit so it'll take a bit longer to go around and some are in a long orbit take a long long while and I think that if we've got say I don't know 20 people or even 100 people or, or whatever and we're thinking where how do I find time to see them all Ask yourself, who should be on a short orbit so you see them daily or weekly or bi-weekly? Who should you be seeing at this point in time to give that kind of investment to? Then perhaps put names on a medium orbit. How, which people should I be seeing once a month or bi-monthly? What should I be doing with them? And then the long orbit is, which people can I see, I don't know, once a term or every six months or even once a year? Who, who's on that orbit? Now, people can change orbits, so someone on a long orbit can become important to have on a short orbit and medium to long, you know, you can change it around all the time. But I found that helpful in planning my time so that I'm giving my time to the people that at this stage need the appropriate orbit that I've, I've put them on, if that makes sense. Next, within discipleship, I think we need classroom, so people are learning formally. We need apprenticeship where we're showing people how to do things. We're taking them with us. We're doing it. They're watching. Then they're doing it and we're watching. And then we comment and help them and then they do it. And we kind of stand back and then they do it and feed back to us. That kind of process of apprenticeship needs to be there of practical, practical implementation, not just learning theory in the classroom, although that's important. And then there's got to be immersion. So if someone's training to be a church planter, eventually they've got to go and do it. But we're still discipling them as they're doing it, as they're learning the whole thing of doing it as they go. Not just the classroom of it, not just having a go or visiting or doing a few things with it, but getting right involved in it. As I said earlier, knowledge, character and skills, they're the three, I think, quite important components of how a disciple grows in knowledge and character and skills. Romans 15, 14 shows that. And then what I would say is, uh, is a disciple making pipeline needs to be established. And I would always say start with a very wide funnel. Don't write anybody off unless they completely exclude themselves from the process, disqualify themselves in some way. Start with a very wide funnel. You remember that David wasn't even selected in the first run through because he was just thought to be a young lad out with the sheep. And he wasn't even brought in for Samuel to look at to see is this the Lord's anointed. But he was the Lord's anointed. So sometimes watch the back row, watch the quiet, watch the person who doesn't say much, watch the one 
who maybe doesn't have much to show um, outwardly to start with, because often there can be a real heart for God there that just needs nurturing and developing. And often it's people that emerge rather than arrive who are the ones that God over time turns from a shepherd boy into a giant slayer. So just be uh, start with a wide funnel and then narrow it down. Invite people. Some people prefer invitation. Some people prefer challenge. Uh, different wirings of different personalities. But just call people into a slightly more in- uh, intentional relationship with you, a slightly more investment, and see where people are willing to go. Sometimes people just have to pause and then you pick them up again later. This is about serving the person, not about serving a system. But I found tools really can really help me get a, get to grips with the actual process of discipling. So I hope that has been of help to you, and I trust that um, the this this session will stimulate you to think, wow, the possibilities of creating disciples in what we do as a culture is very exciting. So let's go on that journey together. Bless you. I grew up surrounded by wood. The smell of wood is more than a good smell to me. It makes me feel like home. My grandfather was a carpenter working from home and my father a wood carver. I love wood, but unlike them, my passion is old wood. I call it my junk wood because many of my pieces were saved from literal piles of junk being thrown away as junk. Restoring old wood or old furniture is a great metaphor for the disciple-making process. Our focus for this time together is fostering a disciple-making culture. So, how can we start doing that? We start with one person at a time. In our apartment where we live in Bucharest, it all started with one old piece of furniture that I had saved and restored. From there, one by one, I am in the process of changing the whole style of our apartment from modern to an old and primitive style and atmosphere. Mike said earlier that we should develop a culture of disciple making. Culture shapes our thinking, our conduct, our choices, our desires. When we understand that discipleship is more than an invitation from our Lord, it is a commandment, a good and life-giving commandment, when we live in communion with Jesus, with his people, our whole being changes. What we notice, what we hear, who we notice, how we manage our time, the sacrifices that we are willing to make. I remember when I first moved to Bucharest, this big, beautiful, broken city. It was nine years ago. My eyes were paying attention. My ears were listening and my heart was very open, open to seize every opportunity for the gospel. That's when I met a young woman whom I'll call Clara for privacy. In her late twenties, Clara was at a difficult point in life with a messed up relationship and a messed up career path with too many conflicts and jobs lost. The process of restoring old wood offers a good metaphor for the process of disciple making into the ways of Jesus. They both require seeing value and potential where others see trash and junk and waste. Sometimes it may seem that some people are hopeless, but we know that each person is loved by God and needs his saving grace. So it was important to truly listen to Clara, to hear beyond the words spoken and to show the love and hope of the gospel to her. This relationship took time. It took creativity and dependence on the spirit for knowing how to incorporate her into an already busy schedule. Discipleship is not always convenient. Actually, most of the time it isn't. This relationship took patience, because we cannot rush the gospel into people, how I wish we could. When you restore old wood, you cannot industrialize the process. It is not like a factory. It is art that requires time, attention, and lots of love and dedication. 
I remember losing my patience with Clara a few times over the years. I felt she should have gotten some things earlier. She should have known by then that her relationship was toxic. She should have been wiser in some of the work situations that she was in. Some pieces of wood are stubborn and they seem to have too much damage. Over those beginning years, I did wonder if Clara was worth the investment. I confess my desire for comfort and my lack of love before you, my dear brothers and sisters. And I also wonder, do the people that we are investing in, that we are discipling, know that we genuinely care for them or do they feel like projects? It was a teenage girl that God used to wake me up, to disciple me, when she told me that she felt like a project for me. Those are humbling words to hear, but they were true. In a disciple-making culture, we understand that we are all disciples of Jesus. None of us is the master, but one. Discipling Clara led me to the cross more than once. One other important observation is to remember that one restores old wood, they need to learn this craft from someone. They need to have people to ask questions to, to learn about the products that you are using to find the best tools and time to work with wood. In parallel, in a disciple-making culture, we are aware that we need each other. Community is essential in the discipleship process. If it were just me that had invested in Clara, she would have gotten a limited view of God because of my limited time, experience, resources. Being part of a community of disciples of Jesus, surrounded by the local church, this enriched her life and mine. I do have to make a caution before the end. Be aware that you can get hurt. Old wood is not smooth. It might have rusty metal attached to it. You might get splinters or scratches or even break something in the process, like your back. Similarly, when you work with people, expect to get hurt to be disappointed, to get tired and out of patience. We will constantly have to remember why we are doing what we are doing, where our reward is, who gets the glory, who is in control. It will often get rough and painful, but we are not alone. The master is there with us every step of the way. Through the Holy Spirit, he will invite us to rest, to trust in him, to celebrate his work in others and in ourselves. We will learn how to praise God for who he is, not for what he gives. We will become more like our master, more like Jesus. Nine years later, Clara is a dear friend and a leader that I have the privilege of working with. I was able to witness her journey from non-believer to maturing Christ, and it fills my heart with joy to remember this, and it leads me to my knees. It is a joy to see the finished product of an old piece in our home, to celebrate how a piece of wood that was found in mud or manure, or maybe was forgotten under decades of dust, how it became a beautiful piece in our home. But not all journeys are like that. Many of my discipleship relationships haven't been so successful. Like Mike was saying, in a disciple-making culture, in the kingdom of God, success is defined differently. The metaphor of restoring old wood is limited because there is no way we can use an image to illustrate the most amazing work that our Lord and Savior has done. He breathes life into dead souls. No matter what I do, I cannot breathe life into old, dead wood. What our master, Jesus, continues to do is that he pours his life into old chunk wood and brings it to life, brings us to life. That is our master. And he is inviting us to join him in his mission, giving us a purpose and a strategy. As we follow him, 
as we learn from him, as we do what he does, as we read in 1 John 2, 6, we become more and more like him, like Jesus, like our master. The metaphor of wood also points us to a different wood with capital W. That wood that became a cross that lifted our master above the earth in order for him to become our savior and redeemer, our restorer. The master gave his life for ours. That wood was an instrument of torture and a proof of love. The master gave his own life away so we can have access to him and his life. That, that is the motivation for our work here, for our mission, for cultivating a culture of disciple making that is focused on worshiping our master with our whole lives. That is why discipleship is more than an event, more than a program. That is the reason why we get our hands dirty, our fingers bruised, our hearts broken sometimes, our back hunched as we restore old wood. Because we see treasures where others see trash, junk, waste, something to be disposed of. Because we have the eyes of our master. Jesus, our master sees the people in your life and mine. He sees what they could become and is inviting us to be part of that restoration process, nurturing not just what they could become, but also what we can become. Thank you, Diana and Mike, for those inspiring words, as well as the partnership in the gospel over the last few months as we've been preparing for this talk. We'd like now to invite all of you who are watching this video to join us in this partnership in the gospel, we believe that disciple making is a key element for revival across Europe. In that vein, we'd like to have you join us in a group of people who experience both of the things that Mike and Diana were talking about, family and apprenticeship. Family in being there for one another, encouraging one another to keep running the race that Christ has set before us, as well as apprenticeship to learn from our master, as well as, one from, as well as one another, where do we see the victory of the cross making inroads in growing believers in maturity in the faith, as well as reaching those who do not yet know Jesus? If you're interested in joining us, we'd love to have you. Please look at the description of this video, and in it you'll see a place for your name and your email. Uh, fill those in, send it in, and we'll get in touch. Uh, the idea is to get together locally as well as online and connecting groups across Europe to celebrate the victory of Christ and to learn with one another how we can continue to partner in the gospel and to see revival across the continent. Thank you.